a huge story to continue to tackle today. In recent years, we have covered what many see on U.S. campuses as the deterioration of education and active open scholarly debate that were the foundation of these once great institutions. And while that was happening, these universities spent an awful lot of time and effort and memo sending to champion safe spaces and zero tolerance for everything from trans rights to offensive dining like tacos. But after having protected so many groups, it looks like there is a glaring hole in the policy. It doesn't appear to extend to Jews post-October 7th. Watch. Why did Penn let Professor Ahmad Amala off the hook, who led hundreds of students in chanting, there's only one solution, Intifada revolution? Why does that professor still have a job at your university? Representative, our approach to uh, speech is as I identified, it follows and is guided by the United States Constitution, uh, which allows for robust perspectives. Based upon your testimony, you understand that this call for intifada is to commit genocide against the Jewish people in Israel and globally, correct? I will say again, that type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. Do you believe that type of hateful speech is contrary to Harvard's code of conduct, or is it allowed at Harvard? It is at odds with the values of Harvard. Can you but not say here that it is against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. It's when that speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies against bullying, harassment, Does that speech and not cross that barrier? Does that speech not call for the genocide of Jews and the elimination of Israel? When you that testify that you understand that is the def definition of intifada. Is that speech, speech according to the code of conduct or not? We embrace a commitment to free expression and give a wide berth to free expression even of views that are objectionable. You and I both know that's defensive. not the case. Hmm. Elise Stefanik went to Harvard, uh, so she's passionate about that on a number of levels. Joining me now, New York Post columnist Ricky Schlott, who has an exclusive report on the cost of the backlash for Ivy League schools. Ricky, great to have you with us. Uh, it, it has been quite interesting to see what has happened since October 7th, as donors who might have looked askance at some of the things that were going on on these campuses are now pulling wholesale out of supporting them in some cases. What are you seeing? Absolutely, and these schools are going to have to find out how they're going to fill the gap from these major donors who are pulling pledges for years on end, which might mean that smaller dollar donors now, you know, in the past couple of years, you'd have to donate $20 million to actually make a difference in getting into Harvard. Now that might be closer to $2 million, according to some sources that I spoke to. But I think the, the true irony here is these schools are suddenly professing this allegiance to free speech. But the reason that things are so dire on their campuses is because they've dismally failed. Make no mistake, it's no coincidence that these most elite schools with the lowest free speech rankings, according to national data, are the schools where anti-Semitism is thriving. Because when discourse cannot happen out in the open and when competing views can't meet in, in civil dialogue and discourse, they go underground, they fester, they become more extreme, and then in moments of conflict like this, they rear their head and all of a sudden you have Harvard students for Hamas. I mean, it's so stunning to watch this. It almost feels like you're in an upside down world. I mean, you watch the protection of trans rights, which, you know, you can, you can make a, a, an argument for that. You watch the protection of uh, certain kinds of food that might be cultural appropriation that had upset people in dining halls. And then you have these calls for, for infatata against Jewish people. And you hear these accounts from these students who say, I don't feel safe and I don't see anybody carving out safe spaces for them. Here's another inter exchange between uh, Elise Stefanik, Congresswoman, and the president of Harvard, Dr. Gay. Watch this. Dr. Gay, a Harvard student calling for the mass murder of African Americans is not protected free speech at Harvard, correct? Our commitment to it's free speech. It's a yes speech. or no question. Is that corrected? Is that 
okay for students to call for the mass murder of African Americans at Harvard? Is that protected free speech? Our commitment to free speech It's a yes extends. or no question. She's arguing that they have a solid commitment to free speech. But you hear the irony in what Elise Stefanik is trying to point out there in her question. What do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, according to the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, Harvard is dead last in free speech rankings. This is not historically true. This sudden realization that that free expression and viewpoint neutrality as an institution is something to uphold is really disheartening given the timing. Because when I was a student at NYU, we'd regularly get emails about the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, about Black Lives Matter, about the election of presidents. And all of a sudden, in October, Harvard and Dr. Gay, who was just testifying, were very obviously and suddenly silent on something that should not have been nearly as hard as those other issues to condemn when it's the rape and murder and torture of innocent civilians. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, when you look at this situation, this is Barry Weiss basically telling people, in her opinion, that families who raise their children with this goal of going to Ivy League universities should really start looking at the, the whole thing very differently. Watch this. Friends and enemies are not who they were, not who they thought they were before October 7th. Accepting this might be hard for some of you as it has been for me. It might get, mean giving up on nice things, giving up on Harvard. Harvard and Yale don't give us value. We give us value. Thought on that. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a proud dropout, not because I flunked out, but because I believe that we should stop forking over our dollars and our time and also our institutional faith into these institutions that consistently fail us and have demonstrated that they produce hosts of students that are, are steeped in radicalism and not critical thinking. And I don't think that we should continue to entrust schools like Harvard to educate our future leaders without really scrutinizing them. Yeah, well, you're living proof <laughs> that it's not necessary. She's got uh, a biweekly column at the New York Post and... Um, um, you're just making a great splash uh, in terms of uh, the thought process and thinking. I watched your interview uh, and discussion that you did with Jordan Peterson and your co-author on your book the other day. Really well done, Ricky. Always good to have you with us. Thank you Thank so you much. very much, Pleasure. Ricky Schlott. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilme. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.